Hello, 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 everybody! Thanks, everybody, for being here. How did you guys do last night? A little karaoke? Karaoke! <laughs> did you have some fun, Karen? You did you? What? That was a really amazing night. Thanks for being here. Thanks for participating. Today is our last day. But it's going to be a great day. So that's the great part about it. So what we have is we have a couple different things happening today, but it's the first up is it's my pleasure to introduce Pete Takeda. Pete Takeda is a professional cl climber, not only rock climber, every genre of climbing he has done this. So one of the few athletes that have been doing this for 30 years. And so Pete has been from the Peruvian Andes up all, all the way to the uh, Himalayas. So he's going to be talking about his adventures, and he's a sponsored athlete, and he's, he just got back from Peru like last week to be here for us. So with that, I'm going to introduce Pete Takeda. Thanks, Dusty. Wow. You know, I, I had something prepared I was going to just start my talk with, but all I can say is it's a real treat to be here. And if someone told me three years ago that I'd be standing in front of a group of incredible, talented people like yourself, you know, speaking in a venue like this, I would have said, well, you're crazy. That'll never happen. So um, strange things happen in this world. Anyway, as Dusty mentioned, my name is Pete Takeda, and uh, I climb rocks, I climb mountains, I climb frozen waterfalls, and Occasionally, I climb buildings, and uh, this is actually a commercial shoot we were doing where we were uh, exploring urban landscapes and interpreting that terrain uh, through climbing. So uh, the other thing I do is I'm a writer, uh, I'm an author, uh, I'm a screenwriter for the WGA. So I don't know, I've had a ch chance to talk to some of you folks one-on-one -on -one or you know one-on-three or whatever, and uh, I think what came across is that uh, what I do is storytell, and so I give narrative to events and people and places. And I think that's what we're all looking to do here. If there is a unifying thing I see is we're attempting to give our research narrative. We're attempting to give some sort of face or voice to something that, you know, if you're looking at it from the outside world, it's an abstract. So I think narrative is really important. And so I'm gonna share the narrative of my life. Um, so I got together first with Dusty. We were working around issues of uh, sustainability and outdoor recreation. And as a part of that discussion, uh, I was mentioning to Dusty that I was an early user of Google Earth, and it is my go-to source. It's the first thing I go to if I'm planning a trip or doing research for a book or something like that, because it provides context. So it's been a long, steep road to get where uh, I am now, standing in front of you. And so, um, Ever since I was a kid, I loved the outdoors. I loved nature, whether it was the sidewalk. I loved to play and I loved to explore. Um, this is me at the age of four. I think that's four. But even by this time, though I was terrified and afraid of heights, I loved to climb. And for like some subconscious reason, I knew I would be a climber. I used to draw these pictures of mountains with a snow line on it, despite the fact I was you know, growing up in the sagebrush of Idaho. So, you know, it's always been a part of me, um, part of my life. And so in college, uh, well, I majored in a couple different things, including engineering and communication, but uh, I kind of wanted to do this more, and this is my original passion in climbing. It's bouldering, it's climbing on these low rocks where you're doing these really challenging, exacting moves. And so that's what we did. I spent a lot of time doing that. I think more time than going to school, certainly. Um, I was kind of a hood. <laughs> I probably wasn't a hood, but I'd like to think of myself as a hood. So um, anyway, climbing, I would like to say, ch saved my life, which, you know, it's arguable. But it was no surprise that uh, this hood dropped out of college and then uh, moved to this place. This is Yosemite National Park. Um, I think we had a film or some sort of demo where they were actually using the Earth engine to uh, describe a route that goes up the center of this, uh, this uh, this face here. Anyway, when Alex Honnold free soloed the nose, I was in the valley and heard about it. It was like electricity running through the air. And so, you know, once again, to give his story uh, this kind of greater narrative, you can use things like Google Earth Engine. It's amazing. So, anyway, uh, in Yosemite, 
I lived there for seven years. Um, I bussed tables. I lived in a dorm. Sometimes I lived in a tent. And I uh, got to climb things like Half Dome and El Capitan. I'd like to say I was literally living a dream. Um, there, there's a story behind this I'll tell you really quick because I think I have a little more time than seven minutes. But uh, anyway, this is the restaurant uniform we had to wear. So I would literally be bussing, <coughs> bussing tables in the uh, uh, restaurant. And as a gag, I brought this up on El Capitan and climbed El Cap in this, uh, this uh, climber's suit they had. So anyway. Um, it was around this time that I started getting a little notoriety, like I was very prolific in my climbing, I was very driven, I trained really hard, and uh, I also started writing. Um, and then I moved to Colorado, and that's where I, I was able to pick up some skill sets in climbing that you couldn't in California, and that includes ice and mixed climbing. Yes, yeah, so I did a lot of ice climbing, started appearing in ads for various companies. It, it's funny, the other day I was talking and, and all these things took place in this analog realm. So, you know, there's all this print media out there that is now moldering on shelves somewhere in a, you know, a library somewhere. But the, the funny thing is, is uh, none of this has been digitized. So I think there's this whole part of history that, that's, that gets lost a little bit, whether it's personal history or, you know, a greater history. So, so that's something we can work on here. <laughs> Anyway, I started writing for uh, climbing magazines, um, and you know, more important than that, I, I also started taking trips to the bigger ranges, and this particular peak is called Shivling, and it's in the Indian Himalayas. In the background, we can see the famous uh, Meru shark's fin, which I tried three times. I think I spent a year of my life living in a tent spread out over three years trying to climb this, uh, this peak. But I also kept riding, and uh, you know, Part of what I do is I unearth things, and in this case, I unearthed a story about, and this is a true story, by the way, it's how the uh, CIA spied on China from atop a peak called Nanda Devi in the Indian Himalayas, and in the process, they lost 13 pounds of plutonium in the headwaters of the Ganges River, and uh, the this, this story is actually featured on ESPN. I wrote a book, but what's interesting here is uh, I don't think... I've ever shown these slides in public, but these are actual pictures taken from the spy expeditions in the mid-1960s. And on the right, you can actually see the plutonium battery. It's called a SNAP-19C, and uh, yeah, there's 13 pounds of plutonium in it. Uh, of note is that it's the same type of battery, almost identical to the one that powers Pioneer 10. So these things, in their own way, are not uncommon. Anyway, in 2009, big watershed year for me, I also <coughs> discovered this thing called Google Earth. And it's like a dream come true because, you know, I'm really used to going to a library and going through old maps or going through, you know, uh, online databases to find specific maps. But suddenly there was this thing called Google Earth and you had the entire world at your fingertips. And the, the best thing about it is, hey, this is too good to be true. It is free. And so since 2009, I've been, I mean, I probably get on Google Earth like three times a day, at least, as, as a minimum. Um, so it's a very useful tool. Uh, one of the things I started doing was I would research a, a destination and then fly to California here and uh, talk to an executive at a company like Marmot. And I would actually sell them on an idea of climbing something like this. And so over the course of the last 10 years, I've had probably four or five expeditions sponsored in part or fully based almost entirely on screen captures of uh, Google Earth. And if that's not value, I, I don't know what is. <laughs> One of our expeditions took place in uh, Zanskar in India, but uh, the, the, the cool thing about this is I was able to take these uh, Landsat images and estimate the height of the boulders. And I would actually go into a meeting and say, hey, they go, well, how do you know this is a great field of boulders? I would say, that's because this is a granitic range. Then they would say, well, how do you know if these are big enough? I go, what I do is I calculate the time of day, look at the shadow, calculate the length of the shadow based on time of day, and I can come up with a rough guesstimate of how high this boulder is. 
that's called uh, the Pythagorean theorem, I think. <laughs> I figured that out after the fact. I go, wow, there's a formula to do this. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I mean, that might be rudimentary to you. For me, it was like, Eureka. Oh, it's like, oh my God, yeah. This is amazing. So anyway, you get to, uh, to climb in places like this. Uh, this is in Peru, but you know, did trips to Pakistan, done trips to India. And the process would climb um, you know, 23,000 foot peaks, which are pretty easy to find on Google Earth, but also could find these t amazing 23 foot high boulders. And accidentally, sometimes you find things like this uh, 230 foot ice climb. Um, this is actually a product of climate change in Peru. You have ice caps that are melting, and in this brief period of time, they actually freeze solid. And so for five years, this route might exist. And in five years, it'll be gone, never to come back. So you get to see a lot of that type of really direct frontline climate change in travels like this. So you know, Google, Google uh, Earth is this amazing tool. Um, I did tricks. I also learned tricks like, wow, I can scan or I can take a picture of a, a physical map, a paper map. And this is not exactly lined up. I did this last night. But um, you, uh, you can line up the, the contour lines over the actual physical image. And then you can take this and laminate it and take it in the field with you. And then you actually have a hard copy of this critical map that combines the best of what you find on Google Earth and the best that you can find in um, just a, a, a regular paper map. Uh, you know, I'd say 75% of the expeditions I had sponsored based on Earth images were a success. We found stuff that was as good or better than we expected. 25% of them were a little bit of a disappointment, but I started learning that, wow, there's these simple tools that even an idiot like me can figure out to, to to calculate the, uh, you know, the, the angle of the hiking over time and so on. So to me, it's, it's, there, there, there's a direct value to uh, understanding these tools. You can calculate the line on a mountain. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why this shot is in here. Oh, here we go. It pays to stay hungry. 